Wait, so you quit Facebook? Like you deleted yeah. your account? I deactivated it. Well, you need to make it more active because now I can't do anything with the group. Oh, oh, so it's so it's linked to me personally. Oh, okay. Hold on. I'll, I'll here we are. All right. Well, that makes sense. That's why we don't have a background picture anymore. Oh. Okay. Hold on one second. Here we are. I'll, I'll pull it up. Welcome back. They say. <laughs> I fucking. Your friends hate. missed you. <laughs> no, they didn't. No, they they super didn't. This is a Q and A, which means questions and ass. <laughs> Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. So you worked at the Bellevue store, man. David. I did, yeah. That was yes, uh, the only reason I didn't know is because that, that was like the biggest store in the Pacific Northwest region as far as sales go. I just remember hearing about Holy that Holy smokes. Yeah. Jeez, it was, dude. you know, 100,000 100, a week was... I think pretty common. Wow. That's quite a story. It was, it was yeah. big, man. <laughs> it was really big. Wow. It was busy. Yeah, yeah that's busy, I bet. Wow. Every job in that department felt important, which was cool. Hmm. I got a question that I I promised someone that I would get on the show. Uh, this is from Norn the Butcher out in uh, San Francisco, California. The last episode was badass. I, I know Norm. Um, <laughs> I have a question. So I'm not, uh, I'll let you read it. Just read it. Okay. That okay. Right there. All right. Norm, the butcher, San Francisco, California. I have a question, so I'm not hesitating. Like you said, have you ever had to deal with a mold issue in beef? Our company mm. has our own farmland and processing plant. We've had to toss a shit ton of beef because of mold issues. Shut down the Whoa. kill floor, shut down the processing plant, called in a deep cleaner. Still lost a lot of meat. Any idea what can cause these kind of issues? Also, what's the best way to attack these issues once they arise? Thanks in advance. Where's Norm located again? He's located in San Francisco. He doesn't want his company's name to be in there. Uh, sure. But... Uh, I'll tell. I'll show you guys where he works. Um, oh, there it is. Okay. In yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I was gonna say in Oregon. I'll let I'll let you guys feel this one, but um, in uh, with wild game processing, the amount of kind of nasty bacteria that would come in on those game carcasses, um would just perfuse the entire cooler and 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 end up creating mold issues on the, the farm kill beef um, that we had there also. So I know that was a big issue in custom where I was working um, during game season. Uh, but and it, so it's an interesting uh, question for sure. Yeah. So I've dealt with, with mold uh, almost every place I've worked. Um, the worst is working in Northern Washington up at a USDA mobile slaughter truck that it's hot box or blast cooler which is the cooler you put your carcasses once they're freshly killed in uh to get them down below uh 40 degrees or 45 degrees within 24 hours um was the same as our, yeah which is our the same as our aging cooler um it was the same cooler so you have stuff in there for three weeks at a time and then it's a small cooler and you're also putting in whole carcasses with hot weights around a thousand pounds that are coming in at a hundred degrees body temperature, which you're introducing heat and freshly rinsed and moisture, which that's, what's going to cause that mold is moisture and infrequency in refrigeration. If it's like leafy sporous mold, you necessarily don't want that. And a lot of places will just use, apple cider vinegar or some kind of uh, uh, acetic acid, regular vinegar, and then just wipe that that area off. Now, if it's a little bit white and spotted but not uh, bloomed, that's fine. 
you know, the green and white molds are penicillin based. You want to be weary when it gets into a darker, grayer, blackish color. And but that doesn't mean that when it stuffs dry aging with proper humidity, you're not going to it, it when you see it darken. That's not mold. That's just the meat drying out. Mm. So what what you want to do to combat that is one, never use your hot box as your aging cooler. That's unconventional. No places do that. <laughs> no. And then what we did is we put a a dehumidifier in there that we would have to empty out daily. Then once a week, because the spores of this will become airborne and they'll rest in your uh, co- cooling coils of your cooling unit, that we would turn off the unit, push all the product out of there, spray it with a one-to-one mixture of bleach and water, and then rinse it clean, wait for it to dry turn them back on and that would to be to kill them and i know that's not the best thing for the metal in those cooling units but it is the best thing to get rid of that out of your cooling system if the usda makes you shut down or throw away product always send stuff out to sampling what are they afraid of if they're you know because mold a lot of it's good and then they're not good but not harmful uh benign yeah benign so if you were to trim it off and then you know, send that into sampling to see what it actually is and get plate counts and, you know, end up figuring out if you could reduce it and whatnot. I would do everything I can to avoid throwing shit away. Yeah. I remember when we used to receive those carcasses from, uh, from that operation before I worked for them, I was working in Seattle at that butcher shop and they, they, when you were using that drip cooler as your, uh, aging cooler, they came in pretty funky, man. Yeah. We, we would, We'd always rub them down with red wine vinegar. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I would recommend that. Uh, what would you... It wasn't apple cider vinegar. It was red wine vinegar. Yeah, just because that's yeah. what we had. I said, well, it was the same shit that I made that kid drink. Huh. Yeah. And he had no mold? Nope. <laughs> now, what uh, what humidity would you keep a dry age cooler? Anyone? 60%. So the colder that your cooler is, the less humidity it's going to have. And I always believe the colder, the coldest you can get your cooler without freezing your coils is the best between 50 and 60% uh, humidity. I think that's a little bit too low. I usually I believe keep mine around uh, 70 and then that's going to stop the, the, the funky, the funky shit from growing. It's going to just be more of a, of an age and when I worked retail, uh, we received whole carcasses. And we'd end up with almost the same problem because we would hang carcasses in the same cooler that it's a small cooler. I could touch all sides of it, you know, uh, and standing in one place. We'd put shove carcasses in there, age them forever, but also bring in like uh, huge stock pots uh, to get them down to temp, you know, and introducing all that humidity. So we mm. would put in a small space heater in the corner uh, to help dry out the cooler. And it still kept cool. The heater just evaporated the moisture. A heater or a dehumidifier? Heater. Heater, okay. Actual uh, little heater. Huh. Interesting. Does that mean you have some sort of humidity gauge? Would you recommend having humidity gauge in your cooler so you can kind of keep tabs on how it's fluctuating? Yes, absolutely. Get a barometer, like a sailor. Okay. Um, and they, they're cheap. Uh, I also recommend getting data loggers so you could understand your cooler and look at the data yeah. on, on a graph. Hmm. Uh, they make USB uh, data loggers that are super convenient now that will do humidity and cooler temp so you could see when it spikes during your defrost cycle and things oh, like that. that so, if, so if you need to... Get it all hooked up to your Wi-Fi and that. Fuck yeah, dude. It's, it's nice. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I worked at a place that had a... Ob- obrometer is that is that how you say it odometer no, no, no. barometer <laughs> <laughs> shoot yeah how I fast think, think, are how fast your cooler's going <laughs> um what, barometer is for atmospheric pressure then what yeah. humidity gauge sure um that was like a thermostat that would automatically kick on a heater in the cooler that's essentially what those kind of dehumidifiers are just little heaters. Yeah. And then if you end up with smells, just get an ozone uh, eliminator. It's like one of those particle filters that they used to like sell on infomercials that would, you know, just get sort of smells in the air. 
Yeah. A hy- hygrometer. Hygrometer. That's what it is. All right. So if you guys were going to put this in a into bullet points, it'd be don't use your hot box for aging. Yeah. But I, I think we were the only place that ever did that. Okay. okay. And then it would be clean out your coils. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's what did you say to any cleaner? What was the cleaner you said? We use bleach. Bleach. So bleach out the, so that the mold isn't being harbored in those coils. That's an important detail. Yeah, because right? if, yeah. tr- yeah. if you if you trim it off the carcass and you didn't do that and you push something right back in there, you're just, you know, mold could live on meat and on any surface. Then if you're receiving carcasses, I don't, it's not a bad idea to, to give it an acid treatment upon receiving either. And a lot of places do that. Uh, USDA will do an intervention upon receiving, even if they're not the slaughter. But a lot of retail places don't. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you end up doing a acid treatment when you receive a simple one uh, is, you know, you may have to write this somewhere, document it, but just organic apple cider vinegar mixed one to one with water. And that is going to take whatever is on that and reduce the plate count by a seven log reduction. Mm-hmm. It's going to have a big effect is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, you know, if I were to retail, I wouldn't do that. Um, it's something you certainly can do and i and it would never hurt and when it evaporates it's not going to taste like apple cider vinegar and it's on a whole carcass so it's not a it's a processing aid not an adulterant or not a uh ingredient i guess and then the last thing you guys are saying was get some sort of tracking uh hydrometer uh software to yeah and there, you that? yeah just go to on uh uh, Amazon and find, you know, just type in USB, USB, uh, humidity thermometer, and there'll be like 30 things that pop up. So. And the, uh, the last kind of aside is it, it, have you guys heard of people, uh, uh, putting like a wall of Himalayan pink salt into their cooler for those kind of antimicrobial and dehumidifying or, or drying out effects that, you heard of that? I saw. I've seen a couple places that did that, uh, mm-hmm. and where they just have a whole wall of these huge bricks of of Himalayan pink salt. Yeah, they're expensive though. Yeah. Is, is that the Himalayan salt aged beef that I see that one guy always tagging on his? Probably. I saw this a while ago, and I, I and I don't remember where I saw it, but I just remember being like, okay, well that that looks like what they do. Uh, huh. you know. Yeah, that, that'd be, that's a question. That's a Q and A from me to the Instagram community. What is Himalayan salt aged beef? Walter, um, I got another question here. I've been I've been dying to bring this one up. So it's it's off the Facebook group. Do you guys mind if I if I ask another one? No, go. I want to get through all these. Yeah, this one this one is uh, this one's from Christian Emmons, okay. and he says um, if you could, you know, he wants us to talk about the pay scale for different parts of the country, retail, slaughter, mobile, or uh, or whatever. He says, I've only been cutting meat for a little under two years in a grocery store, making what I think is okay money at $21 an hour and have lots of opportunity for management positions in my current company. I really have no idea how much more or less I can be making elsewhere. Now, Christian, are you are you bragging right now? Are you showing off here right in, for everybody? Yeah. That's what I want to know. $21 an hour for cutting for less than two years is pretty pretty honest wage, I think. I'm impressed with that wage. I am. Yeah. Yeah. Good good work, man. You did it. Yeah, I think so. As as far as like good wages, it's all relative to cost of living. Yes. Um that what you want to have is disposable income and things like that. I know, for example, that Connecticut and Hawaii pay their butchers the most in Alabama, uh, the least. Uh, but I also know the cost of living in Connecticut and Hawaii are vastly different than the cost of living in Alabama. I'll tell you where I'm living right now. You can get a three bedroom house for about 450 bucks a month. Yeah. And the best paying position I could find, which was for, you know, managing a kill floor and a cut shop was much less than what, what Christian was making as an entry level meat cutter. Yeah. Wherever it's living. Yeah. I didn't mean to sound like a like a jerk when I was saying I'm impressed with that. His wage. I actually am. Like a mo- most yeah. of the time, like uh you know, 
people are trying to get away with paying their cutters 15, 16 an hour. That's, that's mm-hmm. to me is like, uh, I've seen that quite a bit. And so, mm-hmm. um, the more years you have, you can start climbing towards 18, 19, 20, 21 would be like beginning management for a lot of places maybe, or that's kind of what I'm familiar with, but I, you have a great point that it's cost of living in region to region is probably very different, right? Yeah. And I'm also not speaking of any union shops either. Um, I'm not talking about like grocery chains and things like that. Like, sure. Cause I don't know. Um, I know that like Costco is pretty good at starting people off in the, in the twenties, hmm. uh, okay. or like their average cutter will make in the twenties. I also know that they're, um, the best at, at that, at that wage. Or time and a half on sundays too i know that yeah when i lived in vermont and i'll just say it right fucking now i was a hassup tech and i was making the most was 13 dollars an hour but my mm-hmm. cost of living was under 400 bucks in an old victorian and then at yeah. one, one point i was living in a four bedroom house that was 900 bucks on nine acres with a pond people would approach when i was working there asking for more money or saying like this place will pay me more my boss is very much like then leave so <laughs> that, that there was there was no that he, he wouldn't match wages that he had no problem finding cutters in new england that's interesting yeah okay so i got uh some things right here meat cutter at costco makes on average thirty five thousand dollars a year Kroger's twenty eight thousand. Sam's Club, uh, thirteen dollars an hour. Uh, you said wow. this is for a cutter. Yes, this is for a cutting position only. Thirteen uh, bucks at Sam's Club, huh? I don't know a lot of these other places. Winco Foods, uh, twenty eight thousand dollars a year. Uh, Whole Foods, thirty three thousand dollars a year average. And Sprouts, thirty one. Uh, Whole Foods hourly about sixteen. I don't know if this website that I'm looking at is accurate. Um, so the, the, I'm not saying if you work at these places, that's how much you're making <laughs> that, that that's just what it, it's saying. I know that, uh, people who come into this industry are more, it, it, what, what are you looking to do? Are you looking to make money? Do you want to be a butcher or, or, or what? Yeah. I think, I think you got to see what's important on that end. And if you want to make more yeah. money, then I would say, get the fuck out of the front of the house and go to the back of the house. Yeah. Or, or just find where Christian lives. And yeah. uh, apply for a job because <laughs> he's doing all right. Yeah, and then it is in Christian. I would say that this is, and this is just advice that I've always taken. Twenty percent of what you're making is worth leaving another job for. Always move up. That you know, and that if you put on your resume a reason for leaving as upward mobility, then you're good. That like no one will ever question that. Like, was could I contact that place and be like? Oh, I left because of upward mobility. That just means you you found something else. Let's see. Uh, got another one on the the Facebook group. It's from Simon Taylor. He mm-hmm. says, "I think we're all missing an obvious question that plagues all butchers. Would you rather butcher ten chicken sized uh, beef carcasses or one beef sized chicken?" Wait, say that again. <laughs> he wants to know if you'd rather butcher ten chicken sized beef carcasses and you know merchandise it the way you would for like an artisanal case. I think is what it means. Or butcher one beef sized chicken. That is a that is a no brainer for me. What is it? On it's the count for of three. Sure. On the count of three. <laughs> everyone either say chicken or beef. One, two. Wait, wait, I'm unclear on what if I say chicken or beef, what does that mean? That means you, you chi- you're choosing. chicken sized beef or beef sized chicken. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, so okay. one, two, three. Chicken beef. sized beef. Chicken sized beef. <laughs> yeah. Size beef, yeah. yeah i'll use an exacto knife and a pair of tweezers yeah uh it sounds like an interesting challenge man i'd love to see a small ass little beef but can you imagine though a, a 1200 pound chicken are we I talking just, about like actual size or like weight because like you know like actual size would be huge yeah i don't know it'd be like i could imagine doing an ostrich I mean, it'd be like doing a Tyrannosaurus Rex, pretty much. Yeah. Huh. I think. With big breasts. See, the, it yeah. would be easy because you could only, you, you know, you could just part it. You could do a part it out in eight eight parts. Where beef, you're going to be like, like all, <laughs> <laughs> with, with that little tiny beef, it's going to be like trying to case a rabbit with all cuts. Yeah. Well, this reminds me of like 
breaking down a whale, which, you know. Have you done that? I've never done that. I'm oh, just I saying, thought you were going to tell me an amazing story about you being one of those people that <laughs> runs them onto shore. What the hell have I been talking about for two hours? Have you got a whale? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I've just barely seen some <laughs> clips of just like yeah. indigenous people, you know, carving up whales and being like, holy smoke. I mean, they're not just indigenous, just commercial whale industry, whatever, you know, just like sure. carving up these huge animals, kind of a whole nother ballgame. Like those brave research vessels going to, uh, the Atlantic that are being harassed by those protesters on that show. <laughs> Did you ever see that episode <laughs> where those jokers like pulled up to the side of them and they were going to hand deliver these guys a letter? Yeah. Ugh. And then they got taken. Ca- they were like taken hostage. Like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Um. That's a that's that's another thing. <laughs> what, what what other questions do we have? <laughs> we have one from um, from David Hilliard. He says, "How do you decide between natural casings and collagen? Uh, pros and cons of both." And uh, Sean Sanderson, who who's a listener and a guy I used to work with, who's a really badass butcher. I think he he's a production head for um, a place out in Seattle now. He said, "You know, kind of probably. I think what we would start with, and then you can expand on this." He said. Uh, Depends on your use. Natural casings work well with fresh sausages. Collagen casings are mainly used for smoking. Do yeah. um, you have any, anything you want to expand on there? Yeah, so it depends on the use. An emulsified sausage, like a hot dog, uh, I'm going to use a collagen synthetic casing. And then, because it's going to make everything uniform. Now, other smoked products like a kielbasa or a you know smoked linguisa, I'm going to use a natural casing on um, mm. uh, just because it's going to give it that, you know, kielbasa smoke. It's going to give it that nice uniformed U that you're looking for on the kielbasa. Breakfast sausages. I use collagen casing uh, for those little breakfast sausages just because lamb natural casing is more expensive and it's going to push my margin to a place that I don't want it to go. Incredibly expensive. Your four to ones. Uh, that means four sausages to one pound. Uh, for fresh sausage, I'm going to use a, you know, around a 35 mil uh, natural casing. And yeah, so it, it all depends on the on the application, what you want. Um, and then casings itself is like this whole art that you see, you know, people twisting them. And with natural casings, when you hang them to dry overnight in a cooler, it means that you don't end up with uh, these big twist knots when you do like your lattice style. I mean, your, your three bunches that's going to save your margin because you're not using like two inches of your casing, every link for twisting. Sure. And then that's going to harden and make it. So when you cut them by hanging it, that shit's not going to leak out of it. But in, and you can't do that with collagen. What are what are what's the casing made out of that? Um, I don't know if you use this for your hot dogs, but we use them at the place I'm at right now, and I've just never asked. It looks like plastic. It's got two black strips down the side. Yeah. Um, you pipe it into it, and then when you take it out, you run it through that thing with a knife. It's got like it, a razor blade that just slits it. You know. Yeah, and it removes the casing. Oh, what, what is what is that casing? Is that just a really thick collagen casing? Is it, it must be something porous because they get smoked, right? Yeah, it's a thick, I believe it's a thick collagen casing. I don't know for okay. sure. I, I could be speaking out of class on that one, uh, okay. which is my new phrase, by the way. Um, it's a good phrase. Yeah, I've been working it into conversations. I believe it's collagen, but I see those blue ones, too, that are essentially the same thing. And that red, uh, black line there is to know when it's going for your quality control that, that it's removed. Mm-hmm. okay sure and then like for like a mortadella i mean like use a big collagen and like salamis and things like that um you know i also use beef bung caps for mortadella mm-hmm. which some people may like it uh to leave that rind on yeah it, it i don't know it tends to curl up a little bit when you use those it seems like yeah and i end up with uh lost because of it because i yeah. can't sell the bends right so it, I like the uniformity of collagen that when you buy natural casing, it's going to be usually a three mil difference from uh, your biggest to your smallest, 
which is going to make some sausages smaller and some bigger. If you're using a V-mag, that portions for you. Now, if you're hand twisting, then you can make them all in the same way. I can't even tell you the last time I used a collagen casing. I'll tell you the first time I used one. I soaked them overnight. <laughs> That's awesome. That sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, was, I was working. I was working with uh, our old buddy that had that game processing place by that old farm, mm-hmm. and, and he was like, "Yeah, I think I think you just go ahead and just uh, soak them overnight. No, they'll be just uh, they'll be perfect." Did they disintegrate? Them, yeah, it was just it was like uh, I think if I think it probably set like Jello a little bit. You know, it was oh. just gelatin, right? <laughs> a bunch of snot um, out of someone's yeah, nose or something. Yeah, pretty much. Um, last question I have from the Facebook group is, uh, it's from Dennis Hayda Jr. He says he's noticed, let's see, um, says this may have already been discussed, but his business, they get whole quarters of beef and cryovac packaged loins as well. Uh, I've noticed that only with the strip loins, the, the ones that are cryovac that the box cuts to come in, some of the loins are much darker than the other meat that they see at, at the store. Um, says that he's heard theories from butchers that he's worked with past and present, but none of the things that he hears seem to add up. So he's asking about when the, you know, the boxed loins come in, some of them are considerably darker color. And do we have any thoughts on that? I feel like this one was asked before. Am I wrong? Someone asked about like protein and like wilting and shit like that before. Sure. Um, and these are from the same animal. Well, I, I think that, I think he's just getting boxes of loins. Okay. Just, considerably darker i know so well i mean i guess sometimes um you know like when you get a sow or when you get an old cow they tend to have really dark meat mm-hmm. like purple, i don't know if that towards, has something to do with that getting towards purple color like that you mean yeah, yeah yeah but also i wonder you know there's there's that stuff uh that I've, you know, you, I've read about in instructional books like i remember in danforth's book he talks about dark cutter uh-huh. When it, when like it often gets brought up in the same sentence as PSE and pork. Yeah, that's that was the episode or a question I answered earlier. Okay, dark cutter. No, about uh, the P- PSE. PSE. Yeah. So, what what do you know about dark cutter? I, I've never really had that explained to me thoroughly. Uh, I don't. I this is the first time I'm hearing about it. Okay, right here. But I I would think that it has to do with an adrenaline and pH level. I think so too. I'm, yeah. That's what I seem to remember. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I guess I guess if it's coming in on box cuts, What's probably it? from you know ruby plant. Uh, yeah, and then if if that's the case, and you have high pH in your beef because of how it was killed, to get to get the best use out of it, I'd turn that shit into sausage within four hours of it being killed while it's still hot. Yeah. 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 But no, so I mean, one question about that: If we're talking purely color, or if there are there other characteristics of these darker loins that are unfavorable, right? Because like, I mean, there is a range of colors you, you're going to come across, depending on a whole host of factors. Um, but it doesn't mean the quality's poor necessarily. But so the the dark cutter idea, like, definitely the quality, it, it, but that idea. The quality is unusable. That's how I've heard dark cutter. It's okay. some sort of like high stress level or high adrenaline that rendered the meat completely unusable. Now, I've never come across oh. that. So it's always been kind of like a – it's had this myth quality to me, sure. which I'm sure it's not a myth. It's, 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 it's you know, it's got to be a reality in this industry, but I haven't seen it yet, um, whereas I have seen a really dark purple – Sows like you're talking about, and really dark mm-hmm. purple older cows, darker purple bulls, and then elk get into you get in deer venison. You get a whole range, a spectrum of different colors going on with that meat too. Mm-hmm. Totally fascinating, and I it, the verdict is out for me um, on what it's got to be diet, but probably there's other care, uh, you know, other factors that contribute to that. I I end up poking the meat a lot and trying to figure out what does this feel like gives me more information than the color. Did you, yeah, can you, you relate to that? You know, yeah. Is this, um, is this tender? Or is this thing like obviously super tough? I usually go by that kind of feedback to determine what to do with it. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I, you know, I, I wish that we could ask. I wish we could just dial up cow science right now. Yeah. Yeah. I want to have him on the Cause, show. Yeah, because because uh, he could probably tell us right away. Yeah, for sure. What's going I mean, on there? Hemoglobin's the word I think of, but all that. Mm-hmm. All, I mean, that doesn't tell me anything other than just hemoglobin is what makes the color of the meat. That's the only fancy word I know related to that kind of stuff. But yeah, cow science would be, I'm sure, the person to talk to you on that. Um, at Cupcakes and Beers, um, asking this question. Hey, what is a razor steak technically? It's a strip steak cut, but it just has a membrane running through it. Thanks. Love listening to the podcast. So I didn't know this. This goes into like names that people call stuff that, you know, the whole name game and the whole everything like this. So I had to ask follow up questions. What does it look like? And thanks for listening. Uh, Strip like a strip loin. Then I sent her a picture of something of meat, not my meat. She said, I work at a shop and they call her a razor strip. I'll send you a picture of it, and then here it is. They both <clears throat> look like vein steaks from from that side of the strip. Yeah. So is it just taking that taking that piece of uh, cartilage off, just the, like the lip off? Well, she says without the the what running through it with must be like the backs or like that that tendon on the top. Is that taking that off? Is makes it the razor steak? Well, she says without the membrane running through it. So I don't know if that's the membrane running that back strap, that that ligament yeah. that you yeah. know runs the whole length, or if that's the um, where your short loin starts tying into your sirloin, mm-hmm. and you get that oh. that double muscle mm-hmm. there. I don't know if it's that, but so that just opens up the the whole things of where I this great, you know. I've gone to many places and I've cut and I've cut with many different people. And the thing I fucking hate is when people do the, play this name game. And one thing I just want to get across is names change everywhere. I, I don't know. And I, and I'm trying to, you know, get in across the semantics, but I've cut stuff and people will be like, that's not what it's called. And look at me like I'm fucking stupid when, you know, I call a pork chop at my work, a rustic chop or an elegant chop. Do you know why? Because yeah. I can well, yeah, that's the thing. I, I, there's there's a steakhouse that I could think of, a real fancy kind of new, updated steakhouse um, that's very popular right now, and they make up all kinds of names for their steaks. And they, I mean, I feel like they could take a dump and put fish hooks on it and sell them as earrings, pretty much, and call them whatever they want, you know? Yeah. Because if it comes from the facility or it comes from the restaurant, and they're calling it that, then I feel like you're a lot less likely to get questioned. Yeah, that like the standard of identity, identity, bleh, identity, identifier, whatever. That we have the nap guide, and it, and it, it's not set in stone. It it, mm-hmm. it changes from even here in America. What you call something on the East Coast, what you call it on the West Coast. We called shoulder clods clods on the East Coast. When I moved over here, they were called cross ribs, and what I call cross ribs here is I call that from the short or the cross plate, which is just those bones. I don't call it the clot itself. So it's just this whole, you know, thing that people, the, and what people call clod steaks here, a lot of boutique shops are going to call those rancher steaks. Yeah. Or I, moose knuckles. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. But like, I, it, it's just this, you know, on the generic labeling with the USDA, there are some guidelines, but once it gets to a retail shop, you could call it whatever you want. You could. Yeah. Yeah. And if I were to open up a shop, I'd just name all the cuts after myself. Just like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At the place in Seattle, I worked with, we'd, we'd take part of the, the picnic and you know, we'd peel the, the cushion off the picnic and call it a, a pork brisket. And people would be like, oh, my God, I have no- I didn't know there was a brisket on a pig. How is it? We're saying, what? It's, it's delicious. <laughs> Are you talking about the, the cushion, which is the clod, or that what would be considered the brisket? Well, I mean, re- really, really the brisket, you know, but we'd, we'd peel it off the, 
okay the, the picnic half and and uh call it a brisket and then we take those take the copa ribs off and call them pork short ribs yeah so i would mm. call those people love that copa ribs and then i would call a pork brisket pork breast uh yeah and then i always call the cushion a cushion sure or i'd call it a sweetheart ham oh that see that's nice yeah it sounds good you can kind of, it's like you can create like a little buzz by novel names. Like people like, hey, there's no end to the novelty of like, oh, what the heck is that? And just wordplay and uh, combining different languages. It's like, it is effective, right? It, yeah. As far as in that retail setting or just creating like, oh, this is our, this is what we call it here at our restaurant. That kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and, I, and I've always said that, you know. When I worked at farmers markets and stuff, I would put spider steaks in. I would put oyster steaks sure. in just to get the conversation going. You know, yep. like I don't think when I worked in a boutique shop, I could sell sirloin flap as sirloin flap. But if I call that shit Bavette, I think it would sell. It's gonna fly. Oh yeah, people yeah. love it. People love the Bavette. We we had there was this guy. His name's name's Joe. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we want to edit out his last name or not, but uh, excellent meat cutter. Excellent dancer. Very good at calligraphy. He did all of our our, uh, invites to our dinners and and events. You know, Mm -hmm. great guy. And and he he would take he'd take um, the floating shoulder off of a sheep and then he'd bone that out and tie it up into a nice cylinder and call it a Saratoga roast or Saratoga chops. Yeah, I've heard. Does that sound nice? So I've heard the Saratoga chop as a double uh be uh, or as a double loin chop from a sheep hmm. that you don't split it on a bandsaw yeah and you have that uh lamb chop doubled nice huh. like you cross cut the saddle yeah yeah what is that uh yeah saddle chops is that what you just said yeah yeah i've heard, heard it called that I just on this same subject. I just finished writing a piece that you guys have not heard yet, but it's actually on this exact subject. And the the position I take on it um, is one common language that all professional butchers worldwide could speak to each other. That would be one word for every single muscle and grouping of muscles on these carcasses. And it just so happens that infrastructure is already there, which is um, scientific names, Latin names. And I, and whenever I say that, it's usually the most unpopular thing I could possibly say. Sounds Be- pretty socialist. There you go. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's uh, it's not very popular. That, that's uh, I like I like that. That's actually that, that kind of freshens up my perspective because I used to have the chef that would call me and ask me for specific cuts by number out of the nap guide, uh-huh. and I hated that. Yeah, <laughs> but but seeing it from that perspective, I think that that actually could be really useful. I got one more question. It's a quick, easy one. <laughs> it's not. Hey, man, love your page. Is there a good website or something I could get info on mobile slaughter? I'm doing a build out of my restaurant, and I want to know if it's possible to do my own. So we've all worked mobile slaughter. Um, what advice would you tell this gentleman who wants to build a mobile slaughter unit? USDA. First of all, he's not going to just, he's not the restaurant and the mobile slaughter unit is, is, I mean, I guess I don't know what all the state, what all states rules are, but as far as I know, that restaurant's not going to have anything to do with that mobile slaughter unit. Those are not that they're not going to be directly linked or working together without several middle steps. Yeah. Does that, does that sound fair? Yeah, well, you could have a mobile solder unit that, you know, puts a bug on it, and then he could break down in-house at the restaurant if it's only for that restaurant. Yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you could, couldn't you? And then when I worked in Vermont, there was a small farm that was also on our USDA inspector circuit that slaughtered one beef a week and the guy processed it himself for uh restaurants in a truck uh no this was this was a shack but essentially the same thing it was yeah 
it was this i never went there but it was described to me as the smallest usda processing facility where he slaughtered and then you know just sold pretty much straight to restaurants just one one carcass a week yeah okay i guess i didn't think of that i should just edit everything i just said right out of there i guess you i guess you could just put a bug on it and take it right to the restaurant but you could only you couldn't do any wholesale from it or, or you couldn't sell cuts or like have an adjoining butcher shop, right? No, no, that it would have to be sold. Um, it could be parted in a commercial kitchen, like yeah, okay. how, how I have it, yep. that if I receive something that can, with a bug on it, a, uh, I could then take it in my kitchen and cut yep. it and then wholesale out of my house because that's where my kitchen is to a restaurant there outside of usda inspection oh okay so that, yeah so the the michigan rule is slightly different yeah um you can if if so if i had the commercial kitchen that i want on my property i could bring the bugged carcass here mm-hmm. but i could only sell it at the farmer's market i could only sell it out of my farm store here or uh through a csa yeah but I could not do wholesale to a restaurant. Okay, so that's how Michigan. That's how Michigan differs there. Yeah, so in Washington, I could do single ingredient items to a restaurant, a steak. I could do. Oh. I could bring that also to a uh, CSA or sell it at a farmers market, and also okay. do sausages and sell that at a farmers market. But I couldn't sell those sausages to a restaurant. Okay. Now, what I yeah, could wow. possibly yeah. do is sell grind to a restaurant, 20 pounds of grind, and then a 1 to 20 pack of seasoning and say, just add this, and this is my special sure. blend oh, yeah. to get around that. Um, so it's going to vary state to state, and we're talking to, I know we're getting off topic from what his question is, but his, I don't know if you necessarily need want a mobile quote unquote mobile if it's just for your one one farm one restaurant uh because if you're going to end up doing more than your restaurant can do then you're going to be stuck with all this shit that you could only use there without building a whole cut and wrap facility yeah and but i I will say that if as someone who has gone through the opening process for a restaurant um with people who did not have prior restaurant experience and with people who did, I would say that if he's already gone through the stress of opening a restaurant and it's working out, mm-hmm. then he's probably got the wherewithal it would take <laughs> to do a mobile truck. Yeah. But I, I want to know what's, are you having a hard time finding places to slaughter your animals or do you not want them to transport that it, it's, you're going to, yeah put in a lot of money to to just essentially i don't know if you just want the name or if you're having problems with your processor yeah it's a cost benefit analysis to see if it's worth that undertaking yeah and then just dealing with the fucking usda is like do you want to introduce that level of unnecessary uh interaction into your life yeah that inspector is going to want free lunch all the time you know what i mean you know you don't want to be messing with that. Yeah. Um, it's not just a truck. It's also building an office for the inspector. Yeah. A restroom for the inspector. Um, you know, the, the, the break room, the, the, the area. I mean, you, you have to have some sort of a, a room between the restaurant and the, I mean, the facility where you could change and, and hang up all your, I mean, it, it would be a lot more than just building a little truck. Yeah. I think. So it, the, those are things you just really want to, to look at and then your costs you know and then depending on the area that you live in it is easier to do quote unquote mobile slaughter versus doing a fixed facility because people genuinely don't want fixed slaughterhouses standalone in their community because people are dumb um and then you have to you know just worry about depending where you live if you could do a soil enrichment program if you live in california then you're gonna have to collect all your wastewater and send it to landfill yeah that's another thing the wastewater and yeah geez well i yeah it it, it just brings it brings a lot of red flags up in my mind but if, if this individual was really serious about it 
I think we could we would probably have we could have a more serious conversation about it. Yeah. But boy, that that would that'd be a heck of a heck of an under, undertaking, especially if it's in an urban area. Yeah. When you guys say bug, you're talking about a stamp on there. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, that's going to wrap this up. I I just wanted to say to Waimea Butcher Shop in Hawaii. Uh-huh. Um, that if those guys are ever thinking about going on vacation, maybe they want to take the whole crew on kind of a team building retreat somewhere, maybe a yoga retreat or something, and they don't have anybody to work. I think the three of us could maybe figure out a way. Yeah, it'd be tough, but we could fi- we could we could move some things around and maybe go down and cover you guys. Um, we'll keep that shop <clears throat> down running. at the shop. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. you, just you know, just just you know, just on us. Yeah, and I think that's the one situation that I would want to go back into slaughter. No, <laughs> <laughs> in Hawaii. Yeah, yeah, and may you guys not get any DiGiorno's this week. Well, he was pushing 80, but he acted 22. He could laugh and drink just like his grandchildren would do. There was square hay on the meadow, second cutting of the year. Well, his summer work was over once they got the pasture clear. Hope you enjoyed that episode of The Meat Block. I certainly did. And I want to thank everyone for submitting their questions. And if you have a question for an upcoming Q&A or a retail horror story that you want to tell us, or we are even now asking for slaughter horror stories for the month of October, you could submit those to on Twitter at The Meat Block Pod. Email us the meat block podcast at gmail.com or Instagram, the meat block also Facebook, the meat block. And if you want to get a hold of Ryan, he is at gather and break on Instagram. If you want to get a hold of David, he is at a farm butcher on Instagram. And if you want to get a hold of me, I am at American butcher on Instagram and Facebook. And all that information will be in the show notes. So just click the info. There it is. Our intro was Ring the Bell, and our outro song is Turnpike Troubadours, Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. And if you're looking for ways to support the show, really the way to do that right now, the best way to do that is to open up Apple Podcast app, type in the word meet, click review, give us five stars, and leave a comment. That would be super appreciative. It's going to help the algorithm. It's going to help us in search results. It's going to get more people aware of us. So if you want to be awesome, like some names I'm about to butcher, like Miss McCarley or N-D-E-L-A-U-R-I, who left comments on iTunes, yeah, that would be super appreciative. Please do that. And another way you could help us out is if you tag us on social media uh, at The Meat Block or use the hashtag The Meat Block. That would mean a lot to us. And until next time, keep your knives sharp and live in the margin. And keep all your fingers. And in October, I'll tell you about a day where I didn't keep all my fingers and got one cut off by a crackhead. Until next time. Your friends missed you. Well, I'm 28 years old now. I was born in 84. And I've been free as I can be and I won't ask for any more So let the fatal play a hold now After I've drawn my last breath Well tell everyone I know that I love them all to death And raise another round, boys, and have another glass Be thankful for today Devil knows we're dead. May we all get to heaven, for the devil knows we're dead. May we all get to heaven, for the devil knows we're dead. Yeah, I can edit this out.